once again, this is Sunday morning, and we simply want to talk a bit. Uh, the network is actually the place, and it's the place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty. I keep saying that it's not the place of honesty simply because we as human beings, and it's obvious that human beings are animals, but I'm not willing to accept that we are the animals of the past. I'm willing to accept that we are rational animals who have the capacity to see the value of morals and what we call honesty and integrity, etc. And so with that being stated, I, I want to talk for a few minutes because I keep hearing something being stated by various theists and atheists alike that the Bible is all myth. And I keep hearing these statements made by people who really don't know anything about the text nor about how to determine myth as a part uh, as opposed to other uh, things that are in the context of the manuscripts. One of the things that we're going to be dealing with tonight, we have Dr. John Shook, who will be with us tonight, and the topic will be confirmation bias, and it's going to be a wonderful program. Now, what we'll proceed, uh, my wife and I show, that is from 8 to 10, will be uh, Professor Graves and his show, The Unconventional Pastor, and uh, Dr. Shook also will be on his show. It's going to be an outstanding evening to say the least. But when dealing with confirmation bias, uh, my wife and I have been talking, and she said, I want you to look at something, and so I did, and I, I want you to understand that listening to my wife grows me up. It, it gives me the ability to be so much more objective. And I'm not talking about listening to her only when I agree with her, but listening to her when it goes against the grain of me. And she said, you know, a lot of the things that you're saying, because I'm involved in, you know, different groups on Facebook that are so-called universalist groups. And these groups, for the most part, they don't want to accept me simply because I want to be too, too, too. And I'm just trying to make a teaching point here. I want to be so extremely honest about the text, what we have, and what we are dealing with. And universalists, for the most part, they want to reconfigure another model of pretending and calling it faith, and that's very unfortunate. Therefore, they like the idea of being a creedalist. And so in time... Uh, how they define things will shape what is the context of the read. And this has been done many times throughout the centuries. In other words, it's like defining Greek terms before you've ever read the Greek text. And so uh, it's convenient for those people who want to form their own theology. Unfortunately, it's the biggest lie that's ever been peddled in the history of mankind. There's a difference between the failed metalanguages of theology and the text itself and the reconstruction models that give us a better, a much better idea of what these writers were attempting to articulate. But let me read something concerning confirmation bias. This one writer, his name is David, and his name is David McRaney. He makes the statement he said misconception he said the misconception is this he said your opinions are not excuse me your opinions are the result of years of rational objective analysis let me repeat that he says the misconception and here is what he is talking about he's going to describe the misconception your opinions are the result of years of rational and objective analysis 
And then he states after that, he said, the truth, here's the truth, your opinions are the result of years of paying attention to information which confirm what you believed while ignoring information which challenged your preconceived notions. I guess my point is, so many times when I'm talking to universalists, and I say, look at the text and what is happening here. And look at what we don't have and look at what we do have. Now, how can you tell me that we have certitude here when we don't? And simply because people have a belief, they practice this thing called cognitive dissonance. That means that whatever the facts are and whatever their belief is, it causes tension. And they want to ignore the facts, and so it just remains. And I'm not saying that theists alone have this problem. I'm suggesting that atheists also have this problem. And I'm also stating that atheists and theists alike have what's called a confirmation bias in many, many cases. So it's, it's like people are looking for X, Y, and Z that will support their hypotheses. Instead of taking an objective approach and saying, wow, maybe better, a better understanding of the manuscript could be a reality, and maybe I might be wrong. Maybe what I heard in church sounded like a lot of mythology, and maybe I'm jumping to conclusions, but I may not have all of the facts. And so when you sit down and you start talking to a lexical theorist, a textual critic, etc., and they start ringing the bell, let's look at the data, let's look at the information, and then if you continue to say all of this stuff is but, but myth, you, you, my friend, are suffering possibly from confirmation bias and other things that make it very, very dishonest. So the challenge is to become honest. It's not true that animals have this honesty built in them. We are an evolving animal. We have become rational animals, capable of determining what is moral, what is not, what is good, what is bad. And if this continues we will have many more possibilities in the future. And so with that said, I want to do not an analysis based upon some criticisms, that is, from the original or, let's say, not original writings, but let's say from some distant writings. And I want you to fill in the blanks and ask yourself, are these myths, or are these possibly in a different category? So if you have a Bible of any kind, I don't care which translation you're reading from, because at this point in the teaching, it's really superfluous. I'm going to be reading out of one, and I'm just going to call it a red Bible. Well, it's the Christian Holman Standard Bible. Let's turn to chapter 5, book of Matthew. And just for the sake of argument, I'm going to read verse 17. We've done this before. This is the red letter edition, by the way. And so for most of you who are clueless as to why publishers actually print some of these words in red, these words are simply ascribed to Jesus. And in reality, this is simply a likelihood. No one is suggesting that this is certain. But people are simply saying this is what is suggested as a likelihood. The same thing can be said concerning Plato if we are to be honest about his writings or the copies of his writings or Aristotle and the copies of his writings. We really don't know as much about Aristotle as we do the Apostle Paul, yet we have no problem in dealing with that. So my point is, here we have a passage 
in English. I don't agree with the translation modeling at all, but just for the sake of looking at what we do have before us, it simply says, do not assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. And the context is, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, I, I want you to ask yourself several questions. Now, supposedly in this context, according to Christianity, Jesus is Yeshua HaMashiach. Now, as a linguist, I would reject the notion that he claimed to be Yeshua HaMashiach or even Jesus Christ. I would accept the notion that he accepted the idea of being Jesus. But knowing, as most people who are knowledgeable, people understand that if you're dealing with a certain culture, they may suffer from what's called confirmation bias. Let me read a little bit more of what David McRaney said. He said, confirmation bias is a filter through which you see a reality that matches your expectations. It causes you to think selectively. But the real trouble begins when confirmation bias distorts your active pursuit of facts. You know, sometimes we need to not just take that in, but we need to digest it. And wrestle with it for a moment. And this is the thing that's wonderful about the Bible. Many of you hear me criticizing the text. I never criticize the text in order to destroy the text. I criticize the text in order to be honest about what is. Textual critics are not for or against. They're simply looking at the data. Simply being willing to be honest about what does exist. Now, let's leave the context of what we call the Greek and simply keep reading what we see in English. For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, now please keep in mind that this is an English text based upon a Greek text. And the Greek text is a translation model of what Jesus supposedly said. So we have at least two transports here. That's not unusual when it comes to modeling anyone of the past. For in the past, when you had good teachers, it's like Noam Chomsky is a wonderful linguist. We should call him a biolinguist. He's awesome. But the majority of his rights, W-R-I-T-E-S, are not pinned by Noam himself. He has people who listen to him. He will simply be in a conversation and people are, are simply scrambling everywhere trying to datify everything that he's saying and they will sit down and write it out and say, this is Cartesian linguistics, etc., Please understand that a person who is extremely wise will normally hire ghost writers simply to write out what they are authoring. Most of these guys don't have the time to sit down and do what average authors do. And so in this context, in order to make the language so much clearer, not ambiguous, these writers... They do not use an objot, a writing system that is a consonantal writing style. They leave the ambiguous to put it in something that can be challenged. Now, if we follow the trend or the mindset of the Jews, the Jews had a tradition. So, number one, the writing style of what's happening here is very much challenging Jewish modeling, that is, of theology. Whoever wrote this is not wanting to play ball 
with ambiguity. I have argued for years that there is no way to disambiguate an object. But when you look at the Greek text, there is a method, there is a practice that does suggest that this is something that can be understood, that is in time, that is if we find all of the linguistic and non-linguistic elements. And this may be a possibility in our future, but right now we're dealing with a small percentage of that category. Let me keep reading the text because... This English text is but a much, 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 much secondary text. And it's certainly built upon modeling. That is a gloss system that was thrown at the Greek rather than realistically reconfigured based upon good scientific modelings of linguistic mindsets. But I, I want you to see what we have even in the failed propositions of theology. I'm going to move a little bit quicker because we are running out of time and that's unfortunate. But I want you to see something. For I assure you until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. Now, the writer does not leave it there, but goes on to say, therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches people to do so will also be called least in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> so if you break these commandments or teach other people to break these commandments, you might be called not out of the kingdom, but the least in the kingdom. If you read the Greek text, the Greek text would have you understand that this is the thing that's being nuanced. Focus on who would be called the least. That is, if anyone starts teaching someone to transgress the Mosaic law and the prophets. So if you teach someone to transgress what the prophets and the Mosaic law are suggesting, that is, in their traditional style of an objod, you are going to be considered the least. Let's see if this speaker slash writer, not one and the same, <coughs> is going in a direction of mythology or is this writer actually trying to account for something historically that would actually reject an entire culture that is in its legal system. As we continue, we will find, but whoever practices and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In the Greek text, this is up for a lot of consideration. There are more possibilities that the writer here is trying to nuance, that the speaker here is trying to be extremely sarcastic it's much like the book of Galatians. Who would count it as a myth when he says, if you think, and I'm paraphrasing, that circumcision amounts to anything, why don't you go ahead and emasculate yourself? Now, this is not the kind of writing. And when you study substantially all of the different things that tag this as not mythology, the continuance of calling it mythology becomes more than just ridiculous. It becomes lacking intellectual honesty. Let me further my point. Verse 20. Here is a designed rebuke. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes, and the Pharisees. So here's a jab. Now if you'll do a little bit of analysis, that is in higher and lower forms of criticism, that is textual criticism, that is if you're capable, you're going to find 
that this is a game changer here. This is a major jab. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This has nothing to do with walking the streets of gold. Heaven here is very much a reality of what's taking place on earth. Once you go back and establish the context, has nothing at all to do with what people are spinning in most churches. This is why I keep saying church models are failed because they give people concepts of truly a myth. That's true. But leaving the church for a moment and looking at the writings, <coughs> even through the lens of these failed meta-languages, it certainly describes something that isn't even close to mythology. The reason I'm saying all of this this morning has to do with I'm getting ready to actually lower the hammer, the boom. Because I'm tired of the nonsense of everything in the Bible being called mythology. Because that's just as much of, of a lie as it is to say that Jesus died for our sins. That is, to make sure that we are sin delivered. And I'm not, I'm not sitting here as someone who is not a linguist. I'm challenging any linguist to come my way and prove to me otherwise. Now, I know that a lot of people can put together little stories and try to compare things that are not apples and apples and try to pretend, oh, we have mythology here in the makings. I beg to differ with you. Over the next few months, I will demonstrate over and over again why this could not be a mythological game here. Am I being clear? I don't want to be ambiguous in my teaching this morning. I'm challenging everyone who would call all of these writings a myth. Where is your proof? You don't have proof. I would agree that much of the Bible is myth, but there are things in the Bible that are extremely useful and valuable to why we have become rational animals. <coughs> this passage happens to be one of them. If we read verse 38 for the sake of time, he said, you've heard it stated or said. Now, one of the things that this writer is doing, he's really saying, you've heard it said. Why is he stating this? Because these people <coughs> were listening to readers they didn't go to synagogue and everybody had a Bible. They went to synagogue because they were listening to someone who would get up and read from an objod. And what that meant was they were going to use a creative process based upon various other writings and oral traditions. And they were going to try to frame theology the way that they could. And these dear people were simply sitting there listening to a lot of mythology. That's true. So this writer comes along and says about this speaker, you've heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Anyone who has taken time to study all of the different renderings of the Abjad will understand that this writer is taking another jab at a theology, that is, of Judaism. <coughs> Quite the mythology, right? Impressive mythology. But I, I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, and don't take this in a literal sense and not understand the way that these people did X, Y, and Z. This has everything to do with debate. Verse 
In other words, if I disagreed with you, I could slap you. That's the way that it was done back then. We ought to be thankful that we're not in those kind of debates these days. I could spit on you. That's another form of saying I disagree with you. Or I could pull your beard. That's another form. This kind of rhetoric is very much in the contest. Very much in the theater, if you will, of rebuking a known theology. Let's skip a few verses. Once again, verse 43. We hear the writer claiming something about the speaker. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. If you know anything about an objod, you will understand that the various renditions orally were that you were to hate your enemy. This is what gave these people all of this fuel to commit infanticide and genocide, slavery. But once again, notice the writer is stating something about the speaker. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So the question at this point would be everything that was stated in verse 17 through 20. (coughs) Does the speaker... That is, according to the writer, have any intent of actually fulfilling the law and the prophets? Or is the writer trying to portray the speaker as one who is rejecting the notions of the law and the prophets? For we have found at least two rebukes here. Not small jabs, but major jabs. In other words, eye for an eye, that's not justice at all. I tell you something quite differently. You've heard it stated, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. No, he's trying to turn these people. So question, if you are utilizing the kind of language flux that the writer is using here, this is not typical. This is very much the kind of language flux that you would use in court. These arguments are sound. With lots of jabs. Trying to get people to think. Now, it's true that the writer and the speaker are using terms, trying to move a group of people because people have this confirmation bias. In other words, I have a belief that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is true. And I'm looking for someone who will satisfy my theology. (coughs) Does Jesus come to satisfy that theology? Or does he come... And actually reject the notion. See these people. (coughs) Were so superstitious. They thought that God had spoken to them. These were the very words of God. And Jesus is contesting the very words of God. Chapter 25. Probably needed to bring more than four cough drops this morning. So often we get the idea because the last verse of chapter 25 says, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We get the idea that this is speaking about heaven and hell. It has nothing to do with heaven. Nothing to do with hell. Now, 
Now, there is a debate today going on about the term eternal. I, I reject the notion simply because it's not in keeping with good linguistic modeling. But let's read this failed mental language for a moment and ask some questions. Chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. <coughs> the church has modeled this as something that's truly mythology. I agree. The Greek text supports simply an idea of trying to mirror something. When I'm correcting my children, we try to mirror. We try to give examples. Sometimes it works, sometimes it fails. And here the writer is going to use some of the esoteric language namely of the listener, of these listeners, because these people <coughs> are stuck in myths and legends. When you continue to read this and all the angels with him, don't go too far with the idea of angels because the author certainly doesn't intend for anyone to think that there are actually angels of any kind. And he will sit on the throne of his glory. Don't go for throne here. That's just hyperbole intended by the author. Intended by the author to shame the people. That is to correct the people. All of the nations will get, uh, be gathered before him, yada, yada, yada. He will separate them one from another. This is all simply to paint something in a manner in which these people can receive a teaching point. So many times we give analogies just to make teaching points. This is all this is. Now, the reason that I'm reading this, it's because many times we take this and say, oh, all of this has to be mythology because look at the language that's being used. <clears throat> look at verse 34. The reason I'm not reading all of it, I'm assuming that everyone listening to me can read. You can read it whenever you'd like. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Lots of people get excited about this as if this is a reality. Once again, this is but hyperbole, intended hyperbole. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with theists, the majority of the time you have to use their language flux. You have to use words like saved. Are you saved? Are you redeemed? Yada, yada, yada. Because outside of Christianese, sometimes they won't talk to you. And so this writer is simply saying, well, this speaker chose to use language flux in order to help some people get past their confirmation bias. Verse 35, <clears throat> for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Now it's important to note that at this particular time in history, that is according to this writer, this individual had gained a reputation. In other words, politically, lots of people gain wonderful reputations today, and when they say X, Y, or Z, we want to follow them that is in their footsteps, and rightly so. There's nothing wrong with that. For when I was hungry, or for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Now I want you to notice 
that this individual who's writing this is telling a wonderful, wonderful story in the sense of doing what? Trying to change the direction of a people who had become a nation without what we call altruism. In other words, these people were not selfless. These people were extremely selfish. And so, in verse 37, we have the writer stating, Then the righteous will answer him. Now, don't go too far with the term righteous. The majority of the time when it's ascribed to Jesus, when Jesus called someone righteous, it's, it's a sarcasm. In other words, you're full of yourself. I could say something differently, but some of you guys couldn't receive me because you're too righteous. Hopefully you got the point. He said, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you something to drink? You know, sometimes we're just too slow to get the point. When did we see you a stranger and take you in and without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? You know, it's, it's wonderful and awesome to me when I see someone who says, I, I don't want to take all the credit. I can simply speak in the third person. I can be filled full of being this this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful mindset of being selfless. So let me bring a king into the picture. And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will also say to those on his left, and please understand that this is simply a story story in order to make a point. Now, when I tell my kids stories to make a point like this, it's not intended to be understood just as a story, but it's intended to correct. And please understand that back in that day, that the arguments that were held before judges were much like this. In other words, they, will, they would tell stories. Even Noam Chomsky, he will use simple stories to nuance ideas in the context of linguistic theory. Now, I understand that what I'm reading here really exaggerates the Greek text. But I'm simply saying that once one comprehends the Greek text, that is for the most part, is lost, but you see a teacher crafting something to change the dynamic of a people. What we see here is, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will also say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, number one, there is no devil, according to uh, Jesus. Matthew, Paul, the rest of these guys, they didn't believe in the devil. But the church, unfortunately, inserted the idea of there is a real devil. And so I can understand why people would say, you know, since there isn't a real devil, you know, this kind of bothers me. I can understand that. But when you're talking with people like Jesus, when he was talking with Peter one time, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. The implication wasn't. There is a Satan. The implication was you're not in concert with me. You're completely against me. And often uh, professors in universities will say, you know, shut up. Stay silent. Or get out of the room. To keep an individual from interrupting something that needs to be done. Once again, depart from me, you who are cursed. 
Don't go too far with the term cursed. I'm not going to explain it all today. We don't have enough time. But this is, this is simply modeling, if you will. Now, I want you to listen to what's being stated in verse 22. He said, For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not take care of me. Now, is this about, is this story about who you believe in? Is this about, oh, if you believe in sweet Jesus, then you die and go to heaven. If you don't, no, you go into eternal punishment. It has nothing at all with who you believe in. It has everything to do with a person trying to take a story and change the direction of a people so they will learn the principle, namely of, you know, you're looking at me, you know that I'm good, you know that I can lead people. Now, let's talk about have you given anyone something to drink today? If so, you've done it unto me. Why would you say something like that? Well, when you're talking to selfish people, normally selfish people only do something for those they get something from. And so once again, this teacher is saying, well, you know, why don't you feed? Why don't you give people something to drink? Why don't you guys give you know, prisoners a visit. You're doing it for me. You know, in life we find people who are more than willing to say, oh, yeah, I'll do this for you because if I do it for you, I'm going to be somewhat blessed. And so once again, the teacher is using an analogy to criticize, not to hurt the people, but as a teaching point to change the direction of people. In other words, chapter 25 has absolutely nothing to do with whether you believe in God or not. It has everything to do with whether you have a good attitude. That is, and whether you're giving someone something to drink, eat, etc. So my question is, are these kind of writings... Chapter 5 of Matthew and chapter 25 of Matthew. One a little bit more with legal terms. The other with less legal terms and terms that really connect, you know, where the rubber meets the road kind of thing. Things that really matter. People are starving all around you and you're so caught up in your theology. You're not doing anyone any good. You'll feed people if you're doing it for me? You'll clothe people if you're doing it for me? You're just doing it to get something out of it, in other words. In other words, you do need some correction. In other words, the entire story is about trying to get people to look inwardly and get past their confirmation bias. In other words, these people are so wrapped up in theology, so wrapped up in a mindset and this writer and speaker are attempting to correct bad behavior. So the question would be, are we still just animals or, or have we evolved into rational animals who are capable of having better morals and have people helped us along from time to time? And should we belittle those who have encouraged positive steps in the evolutionary process in all levels. Thank you for your time.